Hey, everybody out there. Uh, welcome to this week's installment of Tasting Together. My name is Pat Fahey. I'm a master Cicerone. I'm also the content director for the Cicerone Certification Program. And hopefully this week you've got two beers in front of you. I, I know I certainly do. Um, so for anybody new out there, uh, Tasting Together, We've been getting together on a weekly basis to talk about a variety of different topics from the canon of general beer topics. And uh, a lot of our tasting sessions have focused on specific beer styles, but we've also cover covered a few other topics, um, beer and food pairing more recently. This week we're going to be talking well, well, we are going to talk about beer styles. We're going to be very focused on, a, you know, a specific element of tasting acuity, and that is style discrimination. So uh, if you're coming back last week, like I said, we did some uh, pairing. We specifically paired beers with spicy food. I had the most absurd spread that I ever hoped to have for any of these sessions out in front of me. Um, so if you missed that one, definitely go check it out. It was a lot of fun. Uh, if this is your first time here, I always like to remind people, ask questions throughout the session. Uh, I won't necessarily get your questions as they come in, but I have somebody aggregating them for me and I will do my best to make sure that I touch on everything that anybody asks by the time we hit the end of the session. Also, uh, for those of you that have been following along, we hit the end of our, our published schedule today. So we went ahead and got another four sessions queued up. So the next four weeks, and these should all be posted on the blog at this point too. The next four weeks, we have Belgian double next week. Following week, we're going to have Neil Witte back here and he'll be doing Munich Hellas. Uh, the week after that, August 26th, we'll be doing American Porter. And then September 2nd, we'll be doing German pills. So, and Shane is posting them up there right now so that you can see them. You can either find them on the blog, in the comment section there, go and rewatch this section of the video. There are a lot of ways you can figure out what we're gonna be drinking in a few weeks. So. Oh, and one other thing, and I think Neil will touch on this as well when he does his session. But if people want to throw it in the comments, um, you know, one of Neil's specific area of extra special expertise is any and all things related to draft knowledge. And we haven't quite figured how we would port a topic from draft beer into one of these sessions just because a lot of them don't necessarily lend themselves well to sort of a, a shared tasting session. But if there are any specific topics from that area that people would be especially interested in hearing about, go ahead and throw them out in the comments. And you know, like worst case scenario, it'll be like, just grab a beer, bring a beer and listen to Neil talk about this facet of uh, draft knowledge, if that's something that people would find interesting or engaging, so. You can say, if, if you think that that would be not interesting or engaging, feel free to also throw that out in the comment section. That's valuable as well. And that would maybe stop us from doing that. So this week is going to be a little bit different than really any of the other weeks that we've done so far in that we're focusing on... Uh, a skill related to tasting exams, um, you know, and I, I see from all the beers that people are throwing out in the comments that uh, people have definitely come prepared to do comparative tasting between American wheat beer and Belgian wheat beer. And we're going to do, we're going to use those two beers or those two styles to illustrate kind of how I would recommend that you approach beer style discrimination, but more broadly, I wanted to take this opportunity to talk about, uh, about style discrimination as an exercise um, and different sorts of strategies that you can use for style discrimination. We had 
I don't even remember when it was, it was probably a couple months ago, but we had somebody ask a question about how you distinguish between two styles. And I kind of offhandedly said, you know, I could do a whole session on that. And he was like, that'd be great. So whoever that was, here is the entire session on, on beer style discrimination. So even though this does focus on a tasting skill, um, more so than any of the other tasting skills that we test at Cicerone, this is one that requires a lot of outside or additional book knowledge, basically. Um, you know, when you look at the other sorts of tasting exercises that we ask people to do, if you're doing off flavor tasting, you need to be able to recognize the off flavors, but at least in the context of the tasting exam, you don't actually have to like know things about those off flavors. If you're doing a descriptive tasting of a beer, you're trying to recognize the flavors that you find in those beers. But in most cases, we're looking for a breakdown of the flavors when you're, and the flavors that are present. You don't actually need to say on the tasting exam where those flavors are coming from or anything like that. Style discrimination though really does leverage your knowledge about styles because if you don't have a really thorough understanding of beer styles, it's going to be really hard to choose uh, a style that accurately describes um, the beer in front of you. And that fact, that fact that there is such an emphasis on the knowledge that you know about these styles is going to play into the strategies that we use in order to work through a style discrimination exercise. Now, I will also say that style discrimination as as a, an ability that you can hone, it, it has value if you are trying to take any of the Cicerone exams, some sort of style discrimination exercise appears on certified Cicerone exam, advanced Cicerone exam, and the master Cicerone exam. Um, outside of that, being able like, if somebody hands you a beer and you're like, oh yeah, that's a, that's a this, like, that's more of a, like a parlor trick. So like, if you want to refine that trick so that whenever we can go back and drink in bars, you can impress your friends or whatever. Uh, that's one other way you could use this. But in truth, outside of kind of the, the test taking environment, the way that I'm going to teach you guys to approach style discrimination also really helps to kind of cement your knowledge as it relates to beer styles generally and does have some applications in the way that you can use beer style knowledge if you are in a situation where depending upon what you do, you're working with a customer or selling to a retail account or even just like talking in a, in a judging scenario about styles. Some of these same techniques and tactics will be really helpful in, in any of those scenarios. This is so fun. I get to pick which beer I want to drink each time I go to have a sip. It's great. Um, so what is style discrimination? At its core, style, in a style discrimination exercise, you're going to be presented with typically a beer and asked to identify the style of the beer. And there are sort of two different ways that that exercise can go. Um, based on whether or not you're given uh, sort of a list of potential styles that it could be, or whether you're not given a list of potential styles. And those two exercises are pretty fundamentally different exercises. I'm going to focus more on uh, how, I'll talk about both of them, but we're going to focus more on how you work with the scenario where you're presented options, um, because that's, how it's tested on the certified Cicerone and the advanced Cicerone exams. Certified Cicerone exam, we give you a beer, and actually it's four different samples, but for each sample, you have two potential styles that that beer could be. For advanced Cicerone, it's five beers, and each one of those, there are four potential styles that it could be. And then for the master exam, we switch into that, that other exercise where we just give you seven beers and a blank sheet of paper and each beer could be any style. It's one of the most like brutal 
tasting panels. It is soul crushing. Um, it's a, it's a very, very challenging exercise. Uh, and I do sense, you know, since we're going to focus more and, and kind of end up talking more about that sort of discrimination where you are given options, I want to start by talking about open, open style discrimination and, and how at least I approach open style discrimination. And I don't, you know, I know that there are some people that follow this that are plan on taking the master exam. Um, so this may be useful to you uh, outside of that. Like, once again, this could be useful if you were trying to impress your friends or something, but, uh, but otherwise, like this is a pretty intense and very focused sort of exercise. And the way that I typically approach open style discrimination is by just trying to write up a descriptive profile of the beer. So I have a series of different categories that I look to check off, um, you know, within appearance, I want to take notes on what the color and the clarity of the beer are. Um, within the realm of aroma, I want to know what the malt aroma is like, what the hop aroma is like, yeast aroma is like, or fermentation derived aromas like, and then whether or not there are any other sorts of characteristics, like is there smoke, is there barrel character, is there uh, like non Saccharomyces fermentation type flavor notes, any of those sorts of things. And then also sort of noting what the most prominent or what the driving flavors are. Um, within the realm of taste, I want to look at what the bitterness level is, and then maybe also look at whether there's significant residual sugar, um, if there's any acid present, if there's any salinity present. And then in mouthfeel, I'll evaluate for body, carbonation level, and presence or absence of alcohol warmth. And if there is alcohol warmth, how strong it is. So I have kind of this like checklist um, that I'll go through and it sounds really extreme. There's like 10, 12 things on that checklist. But I know at least when I was studying, preparing for the master exam, um, when I was practicing, I would just evaluate every beer in this way. I would, you know, take a minute, a minute and a half to quickly go through and just be like, color, okay, clarity, okay, malt flavor. And when you do that enough times, you develop sort of a rhythm, it becomes second nature to just go through this checklist of different attributes. Um, so open style discrimination, build out a profile of the beer. And as you're tasting, one of the most important things, and this holds true in any sort of style discrimination, um, try to not think about what style the beer is, which sounds really silly. It's a style discrimination exercise. Why are you telling me not to think about beer style while I'm doing it? The thing is, is that if you're thinking about what style the beer is as you're tasting, your, your brain will start to lead you in certain directions. And once your brain is like, you know, I think this might be an Irish stout it's going to bias your judgments. You're going to begin to find flavor notes that confirm your suspicion that the beer is an Irish stout, whether or not the beer is an Irish stout and whether or not those things that you're now finding are actually there. Um, it's, you know, it's kind of like a sensory example of confirmation bias. So in any kind of style discrimination tasting, if you want to make sure that you can make as objective of a decision as possible, try as much as you can to avoid thinking about what style the beer might be while you are tasting. Just take your notes in sort of an unbiased and as objective as possible way. Now, once you've done that, then you have sort of a, a process of elimination exercise. And how you study styles is, is going to kind of determine how easy this is for you to do. But one thing, especially as you study more and more about beer styles is, I find that's very helpful to be able to break beer down into groups 
um, based on a variety of different attributes. So for example, being able to think like, okay, what are all of the styles that are sort of like blonde to golden color? What are all of the styles that are sort of like amber, dark amber in color or dark brown to black in color? Sort of, so having an idea of styles broken down that way, having an idea of like, what are all the styles that have some amount of American hop flavor and aroma to them? What are all of the styles that are yeast driven or what are all of the styles that feature uh, phenolic flavors like clove and, uh, and peppercorn. If you are able to kind of study styles in that way and think about styles in that way, you're going to be able to use this quick profile you've written up to do uh, basically a process of elimination where you're whittling, you're basically cutting out styles that it can't be. So, you know, if your beer is amber, you can exclude everything that is blonde, gold, brown, and black from your potential list of styles. And then kind of, you know, then maybe it's like, okay, what's the most salient flavor and aroma? Is it, uh, is it hop flavor and aroma? Utilizing that then. So, you know, just kind of going through and narrowing it down as best as you can to just a couple of different styles. And once you reach that point, if you're not able to narrow it down to just one style using this method, then you're gonna go ahead and use this second method that I'm going to talk about that is what you would use on the certified or, or advanced exam where you're working with the scenario where you're given a, a small set of styles to choose from. Let's see, let me make sure I didn't have anything else to say about uh, about that sort of exercise. So a couple sort of final notes on doing open style discrimination. It's an extremely challenging, like I can't stress this enough. And if you haven't done it before, you should try it just like a couple of times. If, if you have somebody who can like serve you beers blind, try getting a few beers totally blind and trying to, and try to pick out the style. It's a very, very challenging exercise in part because you're, brain will find little pieces of information and, and steer you in directions that are sometimes totally grossly inaccurate. Uh, so it, it is a very challenging exercise. Practice really does help though. Um, the more that you do it, the quicker you get sort of going through the process of building a profile for a beer, the quicker you get at that sort of process of elimination for, uh, for taking notes on a beer. And if you are sitting for the master exam, like you have to be really quick, you get 15 minutes to evaluate seven beers. So just over two minutes a beer. It's uh, like I said, it's a uh, brutal, but enough about that. Um, let's talk about how to strategically use the options presented to you in a scenario like the certified exam or the advanced exam. And once again, like I said, you can also use this method if you get down to like a couple potential options in, in an open style sort of uh, environment. So I think sometimes and I've definitely encountered people that, that, take this approach. Like you sit down with the, with an exercise on the certified exam and it's like, is this an American wheat beer or a Belgian wheat beer? And the person just like no strategy is just like, this feels like more of a Belgian wheat beer to me. And you know what? 50% of the time, at least they're going to be right. Uh, but that's not a very good way to arrive at your conclusion. Um, you want to make sure that you're actively leveraging what you know about the different styles to arrive at a solid and well thought out conclusion. So the style discrimination exercise to my mind is first and foremost a knowledge test. Um, and when I teach people on how to approach style discrimination, a lot of the work that gets done is done before you actually taste the beer. What I will tell people to do, whether it's certified Cicerone exam or advanced Cicerone exam, where you have two or four options, 
is to look at the styles in front of you. And for sake of simplicity, let's just say it's certified. Let's say it's two styles. Look at the styles in front of you and think about them first to try to determine, you know, in a tasting exam, which I'm currently sitting in, what attributes could I use to distinguish these styles from one another? And in terms of what sorts of things you might look for, um, cues that I'll usually give people, uh, if you can find certain things that would be present in one style, but not present in another. So for example, let's say you're comparing uh, German pills to Kolsch. Very similar beers, but the Kolsch should have some amount of ester character. The German pills should not. That is an a absence versus presence sort of decision. Those are really good ones to look for because rather than looking for like, this one should have low esters and this one should have medium low esters. That's the sort of thing that if you were comparing two beers against one another, you might be able to pick out. But that in isolation where you're just presented with one beer and you're trying to figure out like, well, is this low or is this medium low? That's a much harder evaluation to make. So presence or absence sort of things are really good. Uh, different types of things. If you've got, say, American IPA versus English IPA, you could be looking at, like, does this have American hop flavor or English hop flavor? Um, and then otherwise, in a lot of cases, you're going to be looking at intensity differences. And intensity could be different in terms of fuller body, um, higher level of carbonation, more alcohol, more ABV warmth, higher level of bitterness, overall higher level of flavor, any of those sorts of things. So, you know, some common examples that might fit there would be like, is this an Irish stout or an Imperial stout, or is this an American pale ale or a double IPA? The, those, both of those examples are beers that are relatively similar, share similarities in terms of the flavors that you'd expect to find in them. But one of them in like, the double IPA or the Imperial Stout is going to be far more intense, just much greater intensity of overall flavor. So like I said, before you actually do like taste the sample and try to make a decision, step back first and think about what it is that you're going to be looking for. And one of the reasons why it's important to, why I think it's important to do it this way or why I think that this, you, obviously you don't have to do it this way. And if you have your own method that you think works better for you, that's awesome, I, go for it. Uh, this is a method that has worked really well for me and that I have found has worked really well for other people that I've worked with. And one of the things beyond just helping you sort of crystallize in your mind, like, okay, these are the differences that I might taste. Um, and, you know, helping you really to isolate what is different about the two styles. The other really important thing that this does is when you're focused in on a specific attribute, when you're tasting and asking yourself a very specific question, it makes it easier for your brain to focus on assessing that attribute. If you're just assessing a beer and you're trying to say, um, I'll take the Kolsch and Pilsner example again, like, is this more of a Kolsch? Like, that's a pretty broad question. There are a lot of different things that you might be trying to focus on there. If you are just trying to say, does this beer have esters? Well, now you're focused on like a very, very specific element of the beer. And in looking for that specific element, you'll be more likely to either encounter or not encounter them. This is a technique that gets used in sensory all the time. Um, you know, when we talk about uh, assessing for various off flavors, rather than just being like, does this beer have off flavors? It's useful to go through a really quick checklist and be like, does this beer have diastol? And be specifically looking for diastol. Does this beer have acetaldehyde? Because by looking for those things specifically, you're going to be a lot more likely to spot them. And once again, like that could seem super arduous if you were like, I got to go through 12 different flavor compounds. But with practice and with time, it becomes like a two second assessment for each one. It's just like diastol, no. Like you, you get in a rhythm 
when you do this. So practice. Practice is another huge piece of any of these uh, tasting skills. So let's focus on the beers that we have in front of us now, now that I've been sipping on them for 25 minutes. So in an exam setting, we wouldn't be presenting you with two different beers and asking, we wouldn't be presenting beers to you in this way. If we were giving you an assessment of like American wheat beer versus Belgian wheat beer, we would give you one beer and we'd ask you to, uh, to distinguish or to determine which one you thought it was. But what I would like you guys to throw it in the comments, you know, we haven't talked about American wheat beer specifically in any of these sessions. We did do a session on wheat beer, which you can check out if you want. Um, and I will talk a little bit about each of them after this initial thing, but if you had to taste these, uh, anyone out in the audience, if you had to taste these or taste for differences between these in a tasting exam, what sorts of things might you look for in order to distinguish between the two? And I'm going to casually taste both of my beers while I wait for people to potentially throw something up there. And if I don't see a lot, then I'll just start talking about it. So I'm getting a few different ones, fermentation characteristics, spices and wit. So when I look at these two styles um, on paper and in front of me, first and foremost, the thing that really stands out, and like I said, the, usually the easiest thing to go after in a blind tasting scenario is if it's if it exists between the two is a flavor that you're expecting to be present in one and not present in the other and in and furthermore um this is another important thing to to say not something that's just present in like one commercial example of the beer but a, a characteristic that is like unique to that style um that has to be present in order for it to be a good example of that style. And in this case, I would say uh, coriander. Like coriander for me is the is the biggest tell between these two. Um, you can see if you look at two of these that the color is pretty distinct. But some American wheat beers are paler than others, and some Belgian wheat beers are darker than others. And you can get like close enough in the middle where. I wouldn't want to use that to tell them apart in just a kind of uh, in a blind setting. That would not be the thing that I would want to be basing my decision off of just because there's a wide enough range that you can get overlap between the two, depending upon the commercial examples chosen. Um, I've seen some people mention cloves as well. And I don't know if, uh, if, that's maybe, I guess it depends on the specific commercial example that you're drinking. Um, surprise, surprise, I'm drinking Allagash White because I keep it around. And then I also, uh, I grabbed Oberon for my American wheat. You know, sometimes you'll see these, either of these styles compared up against like a uh, German vice beer where that clove banana profile is sort of signature. I wouldn't say clove is signature to either of these styles. Some Belgian whip beer, some examples of Belgian whip beer will feature a fermentation profile that usually has a little bit of clove character to it. Uh, Hugarten is one in particular that I, at least in my experience, oftentimes will have some 4VG, some of that clove aroma to it in addition to the coriander that's present in that beer. But I wouldn't say that clove is a note that you should expect to always be present in any wit beer. And so 
in sort of doing my thinking about what am I going to look for when I taste before I sit down and taste these beers. Tasting for clove character is not necessarily something that I would look for here. Uh, though sometimes you can also pick out things that like may or may not be present and that if present would be a determining factor. So one, uh, one thing on the American wheat beer side, American wheat beer allows for a pretty wide range of bitterness and a pretty wide range of hop flavor and aroma. Um, a lot of them don't have a lot of bitterness or a lot of hop flavor and aroma, but some of them, I think I saw somebody was drinking a three Floyd's gumball head. Uh, that's a pretty happy beer. If you get significant American hop flavor, you've got an American wheat beer, not a Belgian wheat beer. So you can pick out traits that you would expect could be present. But the thing is, is those really only tell you something if they are present. If you find the American hop character, it's an American wheat beer. If you don't find it, still could be either one of them. The thing about coriander in these is, if you find coriander, it's a wit beer. And if you don't find coriander, it's an American wheat beer. So I really like that as sort of a, a good tell for these two styles. Um, and really quick, just to talk about the profile of American wheat beer, just because we haven't ever talked about it here. American wheat beer is basically like a wheat version of an American blonde ale. Um, unlike German wheat beers that require a significant, like at least 50% of the grain bill to be wheat, there's no requirement like that in the US. So the wheat inclusion is usually a bit lower, excuse me, maybe like 30%. Um, and so as a result, you usually see some kind of like grainy uh, bread dough, bread flour sorts of flavors in addition to some kind of like crackery white bread malt flavors. Um, just like with American Blonde Ale, the style allows for a wide range of hop flavor and aroma. So you could have very low to somewhat prominent hop flavor. Same thing with bitterness. Bitterness, uh, bitterness doesn't range to like anything like pronounced or assertive, but you can have it from kind of like the low moderate to the moderate. So, But yeah, I mean, that's at its core, that's how I recommend that people approach style discrimination exercises when faced with them on, on the exam or in an exam setting. Um, spend a little time beforehand thinking about what flavors you're going to be able to use or what beer characteristics you're going to be able to use to pick the two apart and then taste specifically for those. And that will help you end up at the right answer more frequently. Now, a couple more notes beyond just this, um, beyond just this comparison. If you are trying to study for like the certified cistern exam and you want to figure out you know, what beers might we put in front of you or what comparisons might we ask you to make, um, the tip that I always give people is our goal is that you can't tell the beers apart based on their appearance. So if you look or if you arrange beers in terms of like bands of color, we usually are going to pit beers of similar color and clarity levels against one another. That's a good way to kind of pick out a number of, of possible comparisons that we might throw your way. Um, but then another thing that I just wanted to say kind of in closing before I dig into the questions that we've gotten, um, this form of studying uh, or this exercise, I guess I should say, is a really useful way to study beer styles, whether or not you're going to be tasting um, in part because forcing your brain to do recall really helps to cement the knowledge that you are recalling. And doing this exercise of picking two similar styles and trying to recall, you know, if I were to try to taste these two beers against one another, what differences would I be looking for? Doing that mental exercise is a really useful way to one to strengthen your beer style knowledge, but it also, I think is one of the more 
applicable pieces of style knowledge when it comes to really any scenario that deals with beer styles. I've seen over the years, like people say, why do you need to learn about beer styles? Like you can just look all of that stuff up. And it's true. You can look beer style details. And at this point, like just about any information you can look up. But the thing is, is if you're in a scenario where you are judging a beer and a uh, judge is like, well, you know, I know that we're doing German Pilsners. This is, is, this beer seems a little bit more like a Kolsch to me. Or if you're, you know, if you're talking to a customer at a bar and they're like, I've always wondered what are the differences between these two styles? Like if your response is like, just a second, let me look that up for you. Like that's, you want to have that information on demand, be able to make those comparisons so that you can operate in those scenarios. So I really do think, and it's, it's something that I've used a lot over the years in trying to just continually firm up my knowledge on styles, using that exercise of, of trying to think about how does, how could I distinguish between these two if I sat down and were tasting them? And, and then the last thing that I have to say is that if you are trying to practice the skill for, uh, for an exam type setting, practice tasting blind. Um, you know, tasting beers initially where you know the identity of the beer is a really useful way to ingrain the characteristics of that beer and build sort of your foundational knowledge of that style. However, if you practice style discrimination by tasting beers that you know the identity of, what you're gonna do is you're gonna get really good at pulling out flavors from beers that you already know the identity of. Um, if you want to get good at doing this sort of thing in a blind setting, you need to do blind tasting of the samples because it's just a, it's a totally different exercise. And I think that's the last thing I have to say for sure. So uh, let's see, let me look at the list. Shana wanted me to cover up front. Somebody asked about why we don't post specific brands that we're tasting. Um, once again, this is kind of like a, it's a s small additional like learning exercise that we are gifting to you guys free of charge. The thing is, is if I say go out and buy a whip beer, I'm going to taste Allagash white, then you just grab Allagash white. You just, you, you're, you know that that's what you're tasting for this. It doesn't require any thought. Um, and that's probably what some people want, but we also, you know, well, we do try to keep these lighthearted and fun. We do want people to learn from them. And the thing is, is if I say go out and find a whip beer and you have to either look at labels at the store or like look up on beer advocate or look in BJCP guidelines for examples of that style, you're going to like f build an understanding or a connection to a few examples of the style. And then also the one that you picked will stick with you more because you had to discover it on your own. You will have a memory of searching that out and finding it and being like, oh yeah, I had to find a whip beer and this is the one I picked out. And that will help you remember that better. Um, and then if you do want to taste again, using the styles that specifically that we used here, um, these are recorded. You know now that I used Allagash White and Bell's Oberon, so you can do it at that point. Uh, the other thing too that, uh, the other reason there is that even if I did tell you the exact brands, depending upon where you are in the country, or even if you're like here in Chicago, if you shop at a different package store than I do, you might get a beer that's in significantly different condition than the one that I'm tasting. Um, it's one of the things that's really hard about doing tasting in a virtual setting because uh, when we're in a class, we're tasting out of the same bottles. If we get a beer 
that's been improperly handled, I as the instructor can say, just so you guys know, yes, this is a classic example of a Belgian wit beer, but it's oxidized or it's light struck or it has this other characteristic. I can't do that in, in the virtual setting here. So, you know, I could be like this Allagash white tastes just like this. And you could be tasting an Allagash white that tastes totally different because of the way it was handled. So those are kind of the reasons why we don't post those things in advance. Eric Taylor asks, can you talk about how you look for carbonation in the sample cups that are typically used for the test? I feel those do a great job of destroying the head and deflating the beer. So a couple things. Um, carbonation can be a bit harder in an exam setting, particularly in the certified cistern exam, just because you have to prepare so much beer at once. It's less the cups and it's more the time that the beer spends out of the package before you taste it. Um, especially on the advanced and the master exams, because we're presenting smaller panels um, and we're able to sort of prep them in rounds, usually you're able to get a better feel for, usually you don't see as much loss of carbonation there. Um, the other thing that I would note on that point is that I don't usually determine carbonation level based on like head size. Um, especially because like collapse of head or how long the head persists is going to be driven not by the carbonation level, but by a variety of other factors. So when I think about carbonation or assessing carbonation, I'm usually assessing it as a mouthfeel. And, you know, there are a few different ways you can do it, but like one is that I will sometimes do is just like put the beer in your mouth and like swish it a little bit and the carbonation will all break out of solution and just try it, try it with like a grab, like a Duval versus like an American pale ale and just try doing that little swish thing. And you'll notice that like when you do it with the Duval or some other very highly carbonated beer, it just like explodes in your mouth using that as sort of a, a way to assess carbonation, at least in my experience is better than trying to do it based on the appearance or the head size. Sorry, I got to top up my Allagash white. Let's see. David asked, what's a good source for proper examples of beer styles? For example, a few weeks ago, you talked about how half acre daisy cutter was not a good example of a pale ale. This is excellent too, because it allows me to correct a mistake that I made when I talked about that. Um, I remembered it specifically because, and it's been a very long time since I put on certified cistern exams, but way back when I was doing that, we were always like, we can't use half acre daisy cutter for pale ale in like blind style discrimination. It's too much like an IPA. And when I did that session, I was like, I was like, you know, the alcohol content is too high. And then Shana like pulled the alcohol content is like five, two. And I was like, well, that's totally wrong. Um, so in revisiting the issue with that beer for a blind style discrimination kind of thing is the hot flavor aroma is too intense. It is, it's, if you compare it against something like a uh, Sierra Nevada pale ale, which has a fair amount of hot flavor and aroma, but it's still somewhat restrained. Like Daisy Cutter is just too over the top in that regard. So to so thanks for giving me an opportunity to clear up that mistake that I made. I felt terrible after the fact. Um, for proper examples of beer styles, I would say one of the first resources that I would turn to or the most widely available free resource that I'd turn to is the BJCP guidelines. They offer a pretty short list of of styles, but there's, their examples are going to be dead on great classic examples of the styles. Um, if you have any of our Road to Cicerone books, we list in those for all of the beer styles that are featured in exercises throughout the book. We offer lists of commercial examples that are relatively widely available throughout the U.S., we try to make sure that we hit things that are available, you know, both coasts, center of the, of the country. There's some overlap between those lists and BJCP lists, but there's also some stuff in there that doesn't show up in BJCP guidelines. Outside of that, I usually say go to 
beer advocate, which is kind of a mixed bag because, um, you know, they will like, sometimes the way styles are classified there is a little bit iffy, but it's still a pretty good resource. Um, and, you know, if you think that like something, if you're not familiar with a given brand and you're wondering if it's a good example of a style or not, grab it and taste it, not blind with the style guidelines in front of you. And, and which is another really great exercise to solidify style knowledge and learn styles. And as you taste the beer, think about like, do I feel like this actually matches up with the style guidelines or not? Max asks, has Cicerone ever thought about building out a standardized blind tasting grid like the Court of Master Song has in the wine world? Thought about it? Yes. And in fact, I remember around the time that we launched Advanced, which would have been, I think we made the announcement at the end of summer 2015, we were toying with the idea, um, but... I feel like beer, beer, I feel like is more challenging to get into something as simple as the grid. Not that the grid is simple. I mean, it's a really robust tool for tasting wine. Don't get me wrong. But the thing is in, in the wine world, you're looking at a product made with one ingredient and the goal in using the grid is to answer a slightly different question than than what we answer here. It's similar to the style question, but you know, you're also with the wine tasting grid, you're hoping to be able to identify elements of terroir that are going to lead you to being able to identify maybe a specific region. You're also looking for elements that are going to allow you to identify the age, the specific age of the wine. Um, that's not something like we're not like we want you to tell us that this is a wit beer that was made in the U S and is three months old. Like we don't, it's, it doesn't quite go into that level of depth and it's a, it's harder to do that sort of thing because beer is a much more manipulated product. It involves more ingredients. Those ingredients are more processed than grapes are in wine. So we've thought about it. It's still something that like, I think would be interesting to potentially pursue, but, uh, but it's, a, it's an intense undertaking. I know um, Master Cicerone Rich Higgins did some work to put together a, a sort of tasting grid. I'm not sure how widely he has shared that or what he's done with that since then, but I know he did some work to do something like that. But once again, like, we haven't felt like we could put together something that was a comprehensive enough tool to uh, to work the same way that the grid does. Let's see. Let's see. Ken asks, how do you account for flaws in beer? Right now I have an Oberon that I feel is slightly skunky. Would you get flawed beers on any exam like they do for BJCP? We introduce flaws, absolutely, but we introduce them in different panels other than style discrimination panels. Um, I think Shana said she can post uh, an example of a tasting exam. There are specific panels that are going to be testing you on, you know, does this beer have an off flavor or can you identify these specific off flavors? Um, in the style discrimination panel, we pre-taste everything before it's poured for an exam to make sure, one, we only use beers that are like classic, classic examples of the style where it's like, there's no dispute that this is a Belgian double or this is a Belgian whipped beer or this is an American pale ale. Um, and like I said, we pre-taste everything to make sure that the beer isn't flawed. We aren't going to put a, an oxidized sample or something like that in a style discrimination panel. Josh Lindsay asks, do you have a strategy for going through the off flavors based on intensity and volatility? That sounds like a whole different presentation. 
Um, man, sort of. Uh, you know, there are different aroma techniques you can use. And if you look at like the, any of our syllabi, we walk through kind of the distant sniff, short sniff, long sniff, and covered sniff. Um, each one of those will help to pull uh, certain compounds from the beer better than others, depending upon the compound's volatility. So yes, I will approach it in that way to an extent. Um, but yeah, uh, that's a whole can of worms that might be worth exploring in a different session. It's hard to say. We obviously can't be like, everybody go out and pick out a beer with acid aldehyde um, or, you know, everybody go and buy a spike kit, but we'll see. We will see. Actually, the next question, Tyler Whitaker asks, where can you get beers with off flavors to practice with? Uh, so if that is, if you want to practice with off flavors, the best or learn off flavors, the best thing to use is to use uh, flavor spikes. We sell flavor spikes on our website. Um, the ones that we have are produced by a company called Aroxa. They also sell their own, uh, but if you buy them from them, the s smallest amount you can buy is enough to spike like 10 liters of beer with a given flavor um, in one liter increments. So uh, the, the kits that we have, the smallest one allows you to do like one bottle of beer with each of six different flavors. So. Tom asks if palate cleansing is recommended in the process. And I would imagine you mean in the process of just like going through a tasting exam. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of what to use to cleanse your palate, I would say water is, is the best thing to use going between samples. Another thing that you'll see a lot of people use and which I agree is, is a good thing is sometimes you want to give more than your palate. So much of flavor is derived from aroma. And so sometimes you want to give your aroma apparatus a reset. Um, I've heard people say like smelling coffee beans is the best thing to do as a reset or some, I think that's a thing, especially in the world of wine tasting. It's a, that works, but really smelling anything that is different will to some extent help to reset your olfactory apparatus. And so what you'll see a lot of people do, what I will usually do is just like, smell the sleeve of my shirt. It smells like, you know, dryer sheets or, or is even like a relatively neutral smell, but it is different. It is a different smell than the beer that I was smelling. It's another reason why coffee beans aren't great in the beer environment. Cause like you're doing stouts or porters, they probably smell like coffee. It's not going to be much of a reset. So yeah. Um, you'll see people use like bread or water crackers, which I don't know. I, I think that they may serve some value when they're there. I usually just snack on them. Um, and uh, I would say if I'm actually trying to like really clear my palate, it's either water or clear my nose by smelling something different. Oh, what a great question. Um, I know a bit off topic. I don't think this is off topic at all. Uh, if we're smelling coriander, we want to believe this is wit beer. How would we discriminate with it versus a goza that has coriander? So once again, um, you do the same exercise. You say goza, wit beer. Got these two styles. Uh, and also, especially if you're doing this as just like a, an intellectual exercise to help you cement your style knowledge, it's good to note similarities between the two as well, because that further helps cement your idea of the style profile. So what's similar between a Goza and a Whip beer? Well, they're both wheat beers, so and they're both pretty pale in color. They're both going to be kind of hazy, um, and they both have coriander to them. I would say that probably covers the most similar aspects of those beers. What's different, Goza is an, an acid-driven beer. Um, if you look at the style discrimination for wit beer, it says that it can feature low levels of lactic acid. 
but like low levels, like very, very low levels. You'll sometimes see in certain commercial examples. Um, Goza should be notably tart, should have like a lemony, yogurty, lactic acidity to it. So that'd probably be one of the first things that I would look at. Uh, another trait of Goza's, Goza's usually have some amount of salt added. That could be a tougher one to go for because some people's interpretation of Goza's take a very light touch with the salt where it more just kind of like boosts the body a little bit and maybe amps up the sweetness of the beer a little bit. Uh, there are definitely some out there that are like licking salt. So if salt is present at a really notable level, that would be another thing that would lead me in the direction of Goza. But those are probably the two big things that I would look at is acidity and salinity. Um, and then I would taste for those specific things to help me make, make that decision. I think that's a great question. But once again, like that's a great exercise to do with any pair of styles. And um, it really helps you get good at articulating those differences. And I would say too, and kind of like I already said, I think a lot of times that's one of the most common questions that people will have is they'll be like, you know, there's these two closely related styles, but I just don't really know like what's actually different about them. And if you can clearly articulate how two styles differ like that, that's very helpful for people. Tom asked if we could get a copy of the checklist that I used. Uh, and Shana said she would type it out. So here goes. Um, so I break it out in terms of appearance, aroma, taste, and mouthfeel. And within each of those, I have a few things I look at. For appearance, I'm looking at color and clarity. That's pretty much it. Um, maybe in some cases, head size, head color, but let's keep it simple. Color, clarity of the beer. Uh, in aroma, I'm looking at the sort of major ingredients. So malt flavor, hop flavor, yeast flavor, and then just general other flavor. If there's something there that doesn't seem to come from one of those things, I'll maybe do run a quick checklist of like, does it stand out to me as like an adjunct ingredient, like, like vanilla or, a, or like actual addition of a fruit? Does it stand out like sm like smoke or Britannomyces or, you know, I have an additional list there if I do encounter one of those flavors, but usually you're good just going like malt, hop, yeast flavor, and then is there anything else? On the palate, I'm looking primarily at bitterness, but I also want to do a quick check for like presence of acidity, presence or absence of acidity. If there's acidity, it's going to narrow it down very quickly to a small set of styles. So that's a great one to look for. Um, residual sweetness sometimes can be helpful, but bitterness and acidity are the two main ones I would do on taste. And then in mouthfeel, the ones that I'm going to be looking at are body, carbonation level, alcohol warmth. And that's about it. I mean, that's my, that's my really quick hit profile. If I'm doing like a slap together, um, profile of a beer in all honesty if i wanted to like really flesh it out there's not that much that you have to add to it but in something like a style discrimination exercise that's going to be my really quick checklist 